month of March. And as always, for those of you who are regular attendees, welcome back. Those of you who are new to QLI, welcome. We'll do a quick overview of QLI. Uh, before I do that, I want to welcome John Pearson into the studio. John, it's been a minute since you've been in. Yeah, has been. Uh, normally, you, has been. you present on our third dimension, and this is a little bit of a twist. Yeah, yeah it is a twist. So this will be interesting. So I'm, uh, I'd love to have it be more conversational. This is a little more designed to be on a stage, on a big screen. Uh, but it'll be fun. Yeah. We'll do this. We'll do this, and maybe we'll step, we'll step outside of it a little bit and kind of explain yeah, things. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, John is our director of creativity. Uh, he's got the best title in the organization. But just some quick PR. Uh, if you've ever been to QLI, John's photos are all over the place. If you follow us on follow us on social media, same thing. Um, he is probably one of the most creative people I've met. Not only an accomplished photographer, but an accomplished musician and uh, an amazing writer. So, John, we're really glad to have you today. Thanks, Thanks. for joining us. Thanks. There's, then, there used to be a guy that worked here, and, and uh, maybe even before all, both of your times, his name was Mark, and he would introduce me. He would say, he'd be, give me a tour, and he would say, hey, this is John. John is the funniest guy I know. John, say something funny. So I was afraid, afraid you were going to say, John's the most creative guy. John, John do something, something creative. Man. Yeah. No. Thank, we'll, you we'll just, thank you for not doing it. We'll let your presentation do the talking on that one. Well, and yeah. then uh, we have Don. Don Terry, welcome again. Good morning, everybody. And Okay. So before we jump in and do things over to Don, uh, we're going to hit the important stuff uh, that everyone is probably tired of us, uh, of us talking about, but we're going to hit the important stuff on some housekeeping. So I'm going to share my screen today just real quick here. And uh, just for those of you who are new to QLI, QLI uh, is based in Omaha, Nebraska. We have a post-acute rehab uh, program as well as an outpatient tele-rehab program. So that's a little bit about who we are. Uh, we serve individuals with brain injuries, trauma, brain injury, chronic pain, and limb loss, uh, as well as stroke. As it relates to this population, I would say the majority of the folks that we serve uh, are primarily uh, TBI and spinal cord. Our chronic pain is, is relatively small and a little bit of limb loss. But um, you can see there's our campus. We sit on about 70 acres. About half of it is developed with uh, the buildings and the houses that you see there. So if you're ever in the Omaha area, we'd love to love to have you join us. I'm going to blow this up a little bit so you can see it. Uh, and quick housekeeping. So uh, please use the Q&A questions. Don and I will monitor that. We'll kick them over to John as, they see fit, as we see fit. Um, if we... Uh, it sounds like we'll have plenty of time at the end for some questions and discussion, so uh, we'll definitely have time for that today. Um, but to get your CEUs, as a reminder, if you were with us last month, uh, we've tweaked this a little bit. We hope for the better, uh, but please attend for the entire uh, session. There will be one poll question at the end of the presentation. We will call that out, but there's only one poll question. Um, and then uh, once you click leave webinar, uh, there's going to be a job form that automatically Populates. What we did find out is it's pretty slick for most of our uh, attendees last month. Those of you who have maybe some pop-up blocking uh, or something internal that that um, might eliminate a pop-up coming up, you may have some issues. If you have issues, just let us know. Um, but this will allow you to fill out uh, the the evaluation form, and then you will immediately get an email with your CEUs and the slides. Um, John's going to highlight this a little bit too. Our slides are a little bit non-traditional just because of the way John is presenting today. There is some information on it, but he uses a Mac. And so the way that it populated into the PDF was a little bit funky. So if you are really into the slides and you need them and they don't show the way you want, please reach out. We will also have um, a recording on YouTube like usual. So let us know uh, if that's an issue for you. So with that, um, I'm going to turn things over to you, John, so I'm going to stop sharing. All right. And will, you're up. All right. And then while John's doing this, the, the reason, um, you know, John is great for this is he is a master storyteller. So, John, I know that you and I have spent a lot of time on this topic. And, and so, yeah, kick us off. All, all right. right. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, thanks everybody, everybody, for joining. I, I want, want to start, start off. off by having you imagine, everyone imagine that you're seated in a theater. You guys remember those things that we used to go to before the pandemic? You're in one of those, okay? And you are nestled into your seat. You've got your popcorn. You've got your favorite beverage. Seated next to you is a seven-year-old boy, okay? 
It's, it's a, a relative of yours. You're both very excited to see this movie. You've, You've heard, heard a lot about this movie. movie. The previous play, okay, the lights dim down and the movie begins. And this is what you see. I don't really want to. Simba. If it weren't for you, you'd still be alive. Run. Run away and never return. Kill him. Hey! <laughs> that, that was a feel good, good movie, movie of the year. year. I wasn't, Wasn't that great? great? Okay. okay, so, so what, what would happen if that was the actual movie that was shown? Now, you would be standing in the aisle, raising your fist, demanding a refund. The seven-year-old boy would be sobbing in his seat because he'd be so devastated. You'd want a refund primarily because you were just ripped off for a 30-second long video. So uh, hopefully that went through and everybody heard it. That was a mashup of the inciting incident of The Lion King, Okay. So, and first off, I always wonder, like, how many people haven't seen The Lion King? Because I always assume that everyone has seen it. So I just did this presentation last week, and invariably there were probably about 200 people in the, in the room. There's, There's always three or four, kind of sheepishly. I say, by showing hands, how many of you haven't seen The Lion King? So, like, like 30 hands kind of go up. And then I say, well, that movie is, like, 30 years old. So if you haven't seen it by now... Uh, you're probably no spoiler. Yeah, yeah. Well, I do have to give spoiler alerts because there's probably somebody. I'm curious if there's anybody uh, that's logged on here that hasn't seen it. To give you a little bit of context is important. So the the lion cub is Simba, and his father is Mufasa, who was killed. He was killed by Mufasa's brother Scar. That's Simba's uncle, obviously. And Mufasa is the lion king, so he is the leader of the whole kingdom. Scar's Goal is to kill Mufasa so he can become the Lion King, which he does. And of course, it's a Disney movie. The kingdom turns into a bleak, dark, desolate place. Scar convinces Simba that his father, the Lion King, Mufasa, is dead because of him. Even though it's important to note that Scar, or that Simba did not see Scar actually kill him. He believes it. He says, run away and never returns. And then sends the pack of hyenas, hyenas after him. And, and that's, that's what you just saw. saw. So that's the context. We, we, uh, we have the a line that you have ruined the movie for at least one person. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't ruined, ruined it. it. I just, just described <laughs> one scene. I will ruin it at the end <laughs> when I tell you how it ended. But it's a Disney movie. So if you can't figure out how it's going to end, like, do we think Simba's going to return and battle Scar? I don't know. It's a Disney movie. So I think we can probably pretty assume, pretty much assume. But Disney is fantastic because they are, they are, they are wizards at storytelling and they use the basic structure. And it's why adults get it, like, like Disney movies. The, the Lion King's in town now, right? The musical. And this thing still lives on 30 years later. Movies that you've seen multiple times. Exactly. Show up. We still will show up. They'll turn into musicals. And, and, but the, the reason is, and we'll talk about this, is because of story. That's why. That's what, that's what drives us. And that's, what, that's really what keeps us engaged. In, in, an era, in an era now where we're hard, it's hard to engage people. Constant scrolling in our phones. But we will put our phones away. And when we will be engaged in the story. So we'll, we'll talk, talk a little bit about that. I think too. you're going to talk about this too, but I was watching a movie with my kids last night and it was kind of a sensible movie and, and George is about to turn eight. Charlie is now 12 and, and George is all worried about the situation, about the, the boy who was going to get injured and maybe die. And Charlie goes, dude, the movie's only half over. He's not going to die right now. Oh, that's beautiful. Right? And that's beautiful. Because that, 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 I want to come, come back to that because that, that, there's two things happening with both of your sons there. So, so being immersed in and actually having a physiological change in his body, his the cortisol was being released and he was feeling the tension. And then your the other son understanding, that's just the conflict that's happening. There'll yeah. be, there'll be. But he was still engaged. But he un yeah, of course he was, but he's now understanding story without even telling you yeah. that. That's really cool. So let's go back to that. So if that was the scene, let's say that the Lion King is 60 minutes long, minus credits. That was a 30 second mashup of the inciting incident of the Lion King. Let's say that that was stretched out for an hour. That that that, that what, what you saw, saw was stretched out for an hour. I don't know about you, but I don't know how long I sit through that because mm -hmm. it's not a story. So 
what, what is, is it missing? missing? You, you know, know what um, what is not there? If, if it's, it's not, not a story, story, what do you guys think, think is missing? What do you think, Don? Like, like if, if that's, that's all you saw, what do we, we not, not know? The, the happy ending. ending. Yeah, we don't, well, there's, there's no, no, there's no, no ending. We don't know there's no ending, ending right? There's just like conflict, right? right? There's just like struggle. Well, you also had to give us context of who the characters are. Right. Right. And if you didn't, if you hadn't seen Lion King, you wouldn't know who the characters are. And if you don't know who the characters are, how can you care? I mean, that's that's a key point of what we're going to talk about today. If you don't know the heroes, how can you care? If you don't know the cast characters, how can you really care? And so we'll break down Lion King a little bit and use it as an analogy to the people that we serve and being, being immersed in, in the stories. Um, so every story has a hero. So Last week, I was at a brain injury conference, and I really encouraged it in that group. It's a, it's a fun group because there's a mixture of uh, survivors and their families, and then also providers and clinicians and therapists. So for the clinicians, uh, well, first and foremost, for the, for the survivors, I really encourage them to not think of themselves as survivors. This is, a, this is just my own personal opinion. Because, because the, the fact, fact that they were there shows me they're doing more than surviving a brain injury, right? Surviving means you have a heartbeat and you're breathing and that now you're living, you're alive after your injury. The fact that they were there showed me that they want to thrive. So they're doing so much more than surviving. And I wanted them to think of themselves as heroes that are on a journey. That I mean, it's not hokey, but just for that, just at least for the next 45 minutes. I want you to think about yourself as a hero mm -hmm. and not a survivor. And for all of the providers and the clinicians and the therapists and the doctors and the nurses, let's stop with patients. Just even if it's for the next 45 minutes, let's don't refer to people as patients or clients um, or injured worker or all of these labels that we do. And what if you start to think about them as a hero that's on the journey? Mm -hmm. And and ask yourself some key questions that we'll go through. So every story has struggle. So I don't want to uh, I don't want to discount that. The the thing that is evident to me, especially going to conferences like that, the bulk of the presentations are on the struggle. And so the struggle is the diagnosis, the disease, the malady, the disability. And I don't want to discount that because every story has a struggle and every hero is encountering, encountering a struggle. It's really important to understand how that has impacted their life before and how it's going to impact their life after. So I don't want to discount and say we shouldn't be focusing on that, but it certainly shouldn't be the sole focus. And a lot of times when I go to those sessions, it, it, it is about treating just a, a disorder or a disease. Who's the person that's living with this? And, and most importantly, I feel like, how can we help them overcome these obstacles we're going to talk about? So the story and the struggle. The real story is how the hero adapts, learns, responds, transforms, and how they inspire all of us. I and mean, that's what keeps, a big part of what keeps me coming back now for my 29th year is I get to be a part of these stories and I get to learn lessons and it puts my life in perspective when I have my own struggles, because that's a commonality that we all have. We don't have the commonality of having a spinal cord injury or a brain injury or a stroke. Not all of us do, but we do have the commonality of struggle. We're all going to face that. We all are going to need help, and we're all going to need to respond. So there, there's this human element that that's of why story is so important. Well, and just to to real quick. You know, you're going to talk about some catastrophic stuff, right? Brain injury, spinal cord injury. We'll have some examples like that. But you believe this applies to someone at the very basic level who has a back injury, right? So we have our audience is primarily in the workers' comp arena, right? Right. And so this isn't just for a situation where someone's life has been completely turned upside down. It can be for the person who's out of work for a few days. And, you know, sure. they all have a story too, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the t-shirts at the Nebraska Brain Injury Alliance Conference, um, I think it said not all injuries are, are visible or something like that. And so I think about that too for our folks with chronic pain. 
Um, we've got a guy going through our limb loss program, and I don't know if you've met him, but he's he's just remarkable. Like his his attitude and how he's how he's responding is and that'll put your that'll put your day in perspective. Just spend a little time uh, with him. Um, he had a uh, he was electrocuted on the job and and uh, lost lost one hand, lost fingers on the other hand. I mean, it, it just like that electricity just went through his whole body and he was thrown 60 feet. And um, he was telling me the story yesterday. He said, he said, I was on fire. He said, my, the, the co my coworker said, you were a human fireball. Um, and just like all of the burn treatment and everything else that he went through and just for him to have that attitude. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just like, it, it, it is remarkable of how people just are more resilient than they ever thought they could be. But our whole goal is to help them be even more resilient and help, help them have the creativity isn't just photography, right? I mean, the creativity is how can you now face all of these obstacles and overcome them and forge a new path that you can be excited that your family can be excited about living. That's, that's what it all boils down to. And I think we can only do that if we get invested in their story, not just their diagnosis. The diagnosis is important, but who is this person? How how much are we invested in knowing that path that they were on until it was um, either catastrophically changed or thrown off kilter because of a back injury? I don't know if you guys know this, but I I fell I fell the other day going out going out going out. The, there's there's video of it apparently. The um, there goes on camera, right? right? You know, but I I did. I mean, I fell and I. Somebody, uh, a coworker said, you know, you're old when you fall and people don't laugh. Instead, they run and say, oh, my gosh, are you OK? Because I hurt my ankle and then I had a bit my big heavy backpack with my computer and my camera equipment. And it felt as if like a, an invisible hand was pulling me backwards. And I'm sure the video, I haven't seen it yet, is really comical. And I went down and I laid there and like, and then I did an assessment. Did I break my ankle? Did I, my back's not the best? And I'm pretty sore today. But that's all it would take, right? I mean, that's, those are the stories of um, we all just, we're all just kind of rolling the dice here. And um, that could be one of the stories of the people that we serve. Of like, what happened? Well, I had a big heavy backpack on and I fell. And now, um, and now I need to respond to this. And, and the risk. I think your flexibility saved you. Oh, my flexibility is horrible. <laughs> My, my mental, mental flexibility, flexibility is fantastic. <laughs> but but I do think about those things, right? You you think that just we are all just, uh, you know, five more degrees twist or um, not having a backpack on that actually broke my fall. Um, it's that you do think about life that way too. And then how would I, how would I respond? And how would I, what help would I need too? So yeah, so for our folks with chronic pain, this all applies. Absolutely. Their, Their lives, lives have been, been thrown off. Um, they've been thrown off kilter. So we'll talk about what, what, what the response is. But back into your, your example, I love your, the, with your boys, the, how immersed that they were, right? And I don't know if they, they use iPads and devices and all of that. I just think it's so remarkable, again, that, that these social media companies, it, they've trained me to you just get on and scroll, scroll, scroll. You know that when we create a video and put it on social media, do you guys know what the average view length is, duration? That, that it, Probably nine seconds. It's under three. Wow. <laughs> so, so it's <laughs> under three seconds. And I think I thought about that. I'm like, How? that's incredible. I think what's happening is we are encountering content that isn't intentional. Like, you know, as much as I'd like to say, people out there listening will say, Hey, I wonder what QLI posted on Facebook today, and they go and actively seek it. I don't think that happens. I think you're just kind of got downtime. Oh, there's something they posted. Oh, that's interesting. Three seconds to get on to the next thing. But I don't know what movie you guys were watching, but that was intentional. So you intentionally went to a story. And then when we do that, we don't want our photos anywhere near. Like, and then people will binge watch, they'll binge watch episodes. Sometimes, five, six hours, spent a whole weekend, you know? I haven't seen Breaking Bad. Why? Because the story is so compelling. And I still believe it's the only thing really that can hold our attention uh, in, this, in, this, in this age of just all of us having the attention of a gnat sometimes. So, so why, why story? 
Well, I love that. I love the the reaction. I don't know if it was Charlie or who who said that. Who was upset? Was it George? George. George. So George was really upset, and he was feeling because he was relating to the character. He was relating to the boy uh, in the movie, and 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 what was happening. Uh, and I see Dr. Snell's on, so he can rebut everything I'm going to say here. But there was a physiological occurrence that happened in his body. Cortisol was released. So quarter, when we feel tension and stress, cortisol is released. When we feel for the character because they're struggling, they're having conflict, then it heightens our attention. And we're going to remember that more. So obviously we remember things that we attend to. We don't remember things that we don't attend to. So... It's also a great way to teach. You know, the best teachers use stories because you will remember those stories. The other thing that happened um, is once that once that conflict was re resolved. And by the way, the conflict isn't just the inciting incident, like the Lion King, you know, Mufasa getting killed. If you go back and watch the Lion King, there's conflict throughout the story. It's not just one scene. And there's constant tension and release, tension and release. That's storytelling. Tension and release. It's, it's, um, oh, you know, we've talked about this before. Stories aren't and stories. When you tell a story, you, you don't say, you know, that only could have been for a weekend, my weekend. I got up and I brushed my teeth and I had some breakfast and I went to the grocery store and then I went out to eat and then we saw a movie and then we went to sleep. <laughs> That's not a story, right? But if I were to say, Saturday, though. <laughs> it's after Saturday for you, right? But if you're telling a story, and it, what did you do for the weekend? Well, I, you know, I got up and did my normal routine and then, you know, I had my breakfast and, you know, uh, there was this movie I really wanted to see. So we got in the car and we started going to the, the movie, but now you want to know. Now you're drawing in because something has happened. There has been some conflict. So stories, when you're telling stories, buts are, but stories are, that sounds wrong, but stories are always better than any other stories. So there's constant tension and release with with stories and with our with our folks the, the conflict isn't just their accident or their injury there's conflict throughout and it's how they're overcoming those obstacles the other thing that happens is once we once they overcome an obst obstacle and they're victorious we we care for them and there's also a chemical release you know oxytocin and and dopamine and all these things that that we actually feel in our bodies when when the heroes um, are overcoming obstacles. And we have empathy and we're compassionate. So the other thing with stories, we relate, we celebrate, we empathize, and we build compassion. So this is a lot on the screen. So I'm not going to necessarily go if anything jumps out for you guys here. But I always say, you know, the number one thing is um, this is the buy in, right? So I would love to tell you that being immersed and learning someone's story isn't going to take any extra time. I think it's going to take some extra time. I also think, though, it can happen pretty organically. If there are people who are therapists, what are the conversations you're having during sessions? Um, if you're doing evals, taking a look at your evals, is it all just medical information? Do you have any of in any of the the pieces of information that we're going to talk about and i'll break down an interview um a little bit too so this is the buy-in why would it be important to be invested in someone's story if you if if the goal is to create truly individualized programs i don't know how you do it without knowing who the individual is otherwise we're all just going to have cookie cut programs um just cut and paste and so if you really want to motivate somebody and find out who they are and what motivates them, what are their fears and obstacles? What are their belief systems? What what are the things that tripped them up in the past? Because those things are going to get amplified. So these could be just mindsets, you know. I mean, we were talking about like you that's know, a good point. It's not the inciting incidents, past behaviors as well as yeah, really right. react to them. Absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest the biggest indicator of how someone is going to overcome an obstacle is how they overcame obstacles in the past, right? How they're going to overcome their injury. Take a look at how they did it. And, you know, we are a big believer that that's not set. That's Those are actually skills. You can learn to have more rational thought, and we can give some examples on that later on, too. So you're going to build resilience, and you're going to help people adapt and you're going to have, uh, they're going to be more resolved and be more hopeful. 
And another key thing is that we'll talk about this. We don't just serve a hero on a journey in a vacuum. It's all their cast of characters. So I know that that um, we all have examples of that family members and friends can be super supportive and and lift that person up. And there are other times that that cast of characters isn't always so helpful. But that's part of the story, and that we can't ignore that either. And we are going to all of us are going to find our jobs more rewarding and meaningful if we're invested in this. You're gonna, and here's the bottom line. You're going to maximize uh, outcomes and you're going to reduce costs too. I really believe that. If we're solely focused on finding that magic solution, that magic bullet, that medication, that that procedure, um, and we're not taking a look at all of this other stuff. I mean, we've had countless examples of how expensive that is at being mm -hmm. um, versus just sitting down with a person and 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 really learning their story and helping them forge ahead all right you guys got anything for me here before we move on um I, th I think i'm always trying to put myself in the seat of our listener and i think some of our listeners are not don't have the luxury that we do to see these individuals face to face mm -hmm. and spend time with them day in and day out and, that's a good point. And with that, you know, what would be, and, and maybe you'll hit this later too, but I think that's something for us to keep in mind uh, when we don't have the luxury and, mm -hmm. and maybe some of these, a lot of these individuals I know, um, know the person only by what they've read on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. which is very, very hard. And so I, I think at the very least, you know, we're not, I think, living in this utopian world where we think everyone's going to be able to sit down right, and spend right. hours on end to get to know these individuals. But I think that's a consideration. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I think, think we'll talk, talk a little bit about constraints and one of them just might be access and time. Those are, and, and we have those constraints as well. Um, so I think that's a really good question. I, I mean, the first question I would ask is what's on the piece of paper? So what, what questions are you asking? What information are you, are you trying to ferret out from people? Is it all simply medical? And, you know, is there, is there a, a space in there? Is there a page in there where you could ask some pointed questions about a person's life and what motivates them and who's most important? What are they missing? What do they want to get back to? I mean, these are pretty basic questions when it comes to knowing a person's story. The other thing I, I would say is if you're connecting, you, let's say that you're actually looking at other providers, ask how invested are the providers in the stories of the people that they serve? Or do they just serve the condition? Right. So maybe you're somebody that's a gatekeeper of, of, of getting people services. Well, ask, I would ask, how well do you, how well, how much time do you spend knowing really about a person and how this injury has impacted them? And how much time does the team spend on being creative and trying to, trying to create a life that they can be excited about, that their families can be excited about? Um, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate, that's what I would want. So I don't know. Yeah. I think that's that a big helps. accountability tool, right? So mm -hmm. that if, if I was a case manager and I was working with a, an organization like QLI, that would be one of the first things I would be asking about. And, and it's a way to get information, mm -hmm. right? Tell, Tell me what you've learned about this person so that I can then maybe help weigh in and make decisions. Yeah. And, and you know, when I was in gate kids, I've done a lot of different jobs here and I've been involved a lot in the clinical program but i would it audit is a horrible term but i would think if you're working with some, it doesn't matter what discipline if you're working with somebody and somebody were to say tell me how this is helping them on their journey and their life beyond qli can you argue that for me and i think that's always the litmus test what am i doing with this person do i understand how this therapy this activity whatever it is you know i could be playing a game of cards Tell me how that's helping them be more successful and fulfilled in their life for the vision that you have for them, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that, that we do that even here because um, we can get like, okay, we need to work on their aphasia, right? Why? Who, who, who are they missing communicating with? Is it getting back to work? Is it their spouse? Is it their children? You know that. Or are you just working on them speaking and, and comprehending more clearly? And so I think that's always the goal, even for us internally too, to always make sure that we understand um, what we're what we're trying to get accomplished. So, yeah, I think we'll talk about constraints um, because we have those too. We have constraints of time and access and resources. Um, 
And I get that some people have much more constraints too. So this is my mashup kind of, there's there's lots of different models of, of the hero's journey, but this pretty much, we'll go through this really quickly, but this is kind of how I concept, conceptualize it. So we have, an, we have a person that comes to us and they were living their life. They have this rhythm of their life and something happens typically unasked for, unexpected that throws that life into chaos and turmoil or into doubt about we have stories about whether that life will continue i mean we have those um everything from that to i was going out the back and i twisted my ankle and i fell um which i think is so interesting too so that's the inside is is the injury now the first response typically i know what my first response is and we see this a lot especially with chronic pain i just want to go back like i just want i don't want this to be happening i don't want to be in pain and can I have a can I have a medication or is there surgery that I could do that would get me back to where I was before? And that's a really common. Like I just don't want this to be happening. If if it's a severe brain injury, for example, the person may be so out of it. It's the family that's saying, "I don't want this to be happening. I, this feels like a bad dream. I want to go back." So that first response is 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 pretty typical of just of just struggling with accepting what's going on. We're going to talk a little bit about the villain. We think about the villain as the injury. Well, the villain is the brain injury, or the villain is the spinal cord injury, or the villain is the chronic pain. But the villain really is oftentimes something deeper than that. We'll talk about that. There's co-stars, and then there's the team that come in. We can't do this on our own. We all need help, and accepting that help is an important part. And we have seen people that are reluctant to accept the help that's around them, and that's going to be a struggle for them. There's obviously grief and loss that happens. We have people that are mourning. They're mourning that ordinary world, that life before, and that's a common that's a common response, and that can that can last um, for quite a while. So that's a big part of it. It's just it's just this loss, um, and that can show up in anger. That can show up in um, feeling as if there is um, someone needs to pay, right? Craving justice. There's lots of different ways that that can come up. If you're going to continue on this path, you got to trust. That's a huge element. Those of us that are here to help, you have to believe in that. I put conflict and setbacks throughout again. The, there's going to be setbacks and there's going to be conflicts. As people are getting stronger and working through the grief process and they're, they're, they've got a great team and, and supportive people around them and they're starting to trust and they're having victories, then they can start to adapt. And that's such a key is now that they're not saying, I want to go back, but they're saying, I want to go forward. In spite of everything, I want to go forward. And they're going to face the villains. And then they begin to transform. As they're battling all these villains, they start to transform. And the ultimate is they create a new ordinary world. And yes, for a lot of our folks, it, it, it's going to look different. But this becomes a new, transformed life. And... The ones that I would love to say that this happens all the time, but it doesn't. But um, we know people, um, Don, we, we're somebody that is up on our East Campus that will tell you I'm a better person now than I was before my injury. Like, that gives me chills. Like, what he's saying is I went through all of this, and I met him in the early days, and he's transformed himself, and I know you work closely with him. What an amazing story. And that would be the goal for everybody. It doesn't happen for everybody. People get stuck. People get stuck along the way. They may get stuck at the first response. I just don't even want to do this. I don't have the energy. Grief and loss. Typical place. Um, not trusting. You know? I know the workers' comp crowd sees that, right? Like a, 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 there's an adversarial belief for some people. They're craving justice. Someone's going to have to pay. Um, people can get admired in that. Uh, they, they don't, don't want to adapt. adapt. They, they say, say things like, if, if I can't do it like I did before, I don't want to do it. And there's just this wall that goes up. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So there's there's lots of different stages that people can get stuck. The goal is, how can we help them travel through this whole process? If that makes sense. I also think, uh, including the family in that, um, if that person's not ready, you know, talk about repetition in, in, in rehab, if that family is engaging that same kind of path after they leave QLI, 
Yep. Yep. Or, yep. Yep. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Continuing. Uh, how do you continue to help that person? Absolutely. Through family, job, um, social network, you know, all of that's really important. So, um, because they're not, none of us could do it on our, on our own. So, yeah. So Kelly, one of our listeners just made a really important comment around people accepting help, right? We're in a position where we're, we're ready and, and willing to offer help, but quite often there are people who are just not used to asking for help mm-hmm. or receiving mm-hmm. help. And so, so even that in and of itself can be a barrier yep. to um, a, a really successful outcome just simply because people are prideful or they don't even know how to accept help yep. or that just yeah. hasn't been part of their routine. And now they're faced with something where maybe they don't have the control that they want and, and actually receiving help is one of the biggest things that they could do. And, and that's a skill too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, no it, it definitely, definitely is. is. And then I, I wish I had, I had just a, a one sentence cure, cure for that. that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think, think the, the thing, thing that jumps out is trust in a relationship. If you have a genuine relationship with that person, person even if before they just, just were somebody that never asked for help. Um, I, I think you can, can break down. That's an irrational belief, belief right? right? Is that, that uh, I, I, I do it on my own. I help other people and I, I do it on my own. That's, that's if you can start to break down a little bit, but I think if, if you can build that strong relationship and that trust, it's really important. So speaking of relationships, the, the, the Lion, Lion King, King is interesting, interesting because it's 60, 60 minutes long. The inciting incident is only around five minutes of a 60-minute movie. 38 minutes of the movie happens before the inciting incident, before Mufasa is killed by Scar. So third, oh, well over half is dedicated. This is where I did my lion or my uh, lion dad joke. Um <laughs> It's all with the group. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'll spare you guys that or not. So I said the lion's share of the movie is dedicated to getting to know Simba. I said when it comes to lion dad jokes, I take great pride in them. And I guess you could say it's my main source of entertainment. At that point, the organizer, I kid you not, said, John, you need, you need to move on. Dr. Snell just said face palm. <laughs> <laughs> so literally the lion's share of the movie, 38 minutes, is spent, which is amazing, right? So sometimes we think about the conflict of the stories or we think about Mufasa dying. That's a very important and vivid scene. It's five minutes of a 60-minute movie. How much time are we spending on the conflict when we're when we're treating people? How much time are we spending getting to know them before they ever came to us? Before they ever had the inciting incident, how well do you know this person? How how much do you know what they value? What motivates them? What drives them? What they're afraid of? What were the obstacles that tripped them up in the past? Because again, those aren't going away. And as much as we'd like to say we treat the patient and all that other stuff, man, you know, someone else can treat that. It, it, it's just not going to work. I mean, they're going to get stuck in that journey. Um, so yeah. We, we have a whole variety. We have people with drug backgrounds. We have people with criminal history. Um, and you may say, well, you weren't really a hero before, but everybody gets a, everybody gets a chance. And we've seen people transform. Yeah. Um, the, the individual I was talking about, he was living a, a, he was living a drug life, um, like methamphetamine, like serious drugs. And so, yeah, I mean, when you think about his life now, it's transformed. And, and what, what if, if we would have said, said, oh my gosh, gosh look, look at this guy's history. history. I mean, he's, he's got, got drug history, history, he's got criminal history. history. There's no, no shot. Like, like what, where would his life be if we, we wouldn't have given him a, sh- a chance? Now, now he's, he's got, got, he had, had to do it. it. We didn't do it for him. It's his journey. Um, so, so I get it. At some point, people, people just aren't willing, willing to move. But he was. And that's pretty cool. So how much are we spending knowing the actual, actual hero. hero. The inside the incident, incident again, is the injury. In in the Lion King, King it's when uh, Mufasa is killed, killed by Scar. What's, what's the villain? villain? So, so what, what is Simba's villain? villain? Well, obviously, it's Scar. He's the villain, villain of the movie. movie. Move, Move on, on right? right? That's, That's it. it. But, but Disney's, Disney's really clever, clever and you don't, don't ever think about it, but really, what is the villain of, of the Lion King? King? What, what prevents Scar from returning back home and it's fear and it's shame and it's doubt if that's the real villain it's not scar that's part of it it's part of fear 
but he believes he is responsible and that's why he doesn't return for years. So, um, What's the real villain of the people we're serving? It's so easy to say it's their injury, it's their chronic pain. It's typically the fear. Um, could be anger, could be lots of different things. So how well do we know the true villain of what is preventing from someone from moving forward? Really important part of it. So we can't do it alone. Obviously, I'm uh, old. So there's <laughs> another movie that's almost 30 years old. Tom Hanks and Castaway, right? But, but even Tom Hanks said Wilson, so he couldn't do it alone, right? And, and the interesting, interesting thing is, he's on this, if, if you haven't seen this movie, no spoiler alert, alert. He's, he's on this deserted island, island and there's nobody there. And then this volleyball washes up on shore, and he paints a face on it, and he and humanizes, humanizes it. Because he, he needed that connection. So, you know... Joking aside, even Tom, Tom Hanks couldn't do it alone, right? He had to create somebody to help him do it. So the cast characters, obviously, we are also honored here at QLI to be a part of the team. And so we get to be uh, we get to be a cast of characters for these heroes as they're on the journey. And the cast here, I mean, this photo is great because there's, I mean, who's the hero here, right? Like, there's a hero and it's going away, but what a mix. You got therapists and you got other you got other residents and it takes a village a lot of times and that just shows the investment that people have and um, I think back to that the willingness to go beyond the actual role they've been hired for yeah yes. front office staff yeah yeah, yeah sure maintenance yeah yep. just how we yep. that and, and that don't, don't let that be a, a hindrance or a oh yeah yeah a, yeah. yeah. I, th I think we could go real deep into that, 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 that there's this united front that isn't siloed. Well, I only do physical therapy with it. Like, no, my physical therapy, again, is designed to propel them into a life that we all are envisioning for the person. So the obvious goal is as people are going through the processes that they're adapting and they're transforming, we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, in terms of time, we might just kind of, we can come back to Brian if we have some time, and he's a great example. Brian is somebody that's worked at, that has worked, he kind of works at QLI. He, he works with, with all of our new team members and tells his story, which is the thing. So, so the interesting thing, so Brian tells his story, and um, he was injured in 1989. He was hit by a drunk driver, and he, his part of his transformation is telling that story both in terms of um, people being safe with di distracted and drunk driving, but also just his life path. And uh, so I, I go in with him and invariably I'll see those new team members maybe 10 days later and they say, well, I don't, I don't know if we met. And I was like, yeah, we met um, your first, on your first week in orientation. Oh, I don't, I don't remember. I went in with Brian. Oh yeah, I remember Brian, right? They always remember Brian. A, he's a character, but it's because he tells his story. I really believe that. Um, even with orientation, that's the things that, that they remember. Um, when we talked about Brian's growth, we broke it down into, and these guys probably in other webinars have seen our, our components of learning, but that's a huge part of adapting is learning. That, that's, that's it. You can't transform, you can't adapt. If you're not learning, we're constantly teaching new skills. So we can go back if there's time to talk about I think, Brian. And I think one thing to point out this one is the motivate with meaning one, right? What what I think story does is it ensures that we create some level of meaning and connection. And 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 if I think of the programs that go well or don't go well here at QLI, usually when we are taking a step back and and let's just say one's not going well, we usually land with wow do we really know this person well enough and have we created yep, a meaningful absolutely. program for them so that motivate with meaning we're not going to go through all these components today but i i, I do think that is a key absolutely. component and, and so, so just, just to give you a little more context on brian i know we don't have time to go into his full story and there's a video and everything if if you go to our qli youtube you can see his story up there um if you want to see that but brian when he first came to us he was 
Um, he was a different person in lots of ways, but he was, and he was through his acute rehab. So it wasn't like he was just coming out of acute. He had been living at home for a while and he was really angry. So if you look at that, if you look at that, and understandably, if you look at that hero's journey, he was stuck in that, just, just really angry at this guy who stole his life. I mean, that's the way he would put it. But one thing we noticed is we got to know him is on Fridays and Brian uses that communication device. And at, at that, that time, time, it was called a light writer. It wasn't light at all. It was like a small piano. And all I could do was just start, convert text into speech. And now he's got an iPad and he does all kinds of things. But he would go around and he would get focused, which was hard for him at that time, and get serious. And he would say, have a great weekend, don't drink and drive. And he would go around the place and tell people. And so that was meaningful to him, right? So that's when we said... We got to create, like, well, I wonder, wonder if you wouldn't want to do a presentation on um, the dangers of drinking and driving. This is how long ago it was. It was on overhead transparencies. If you remember, that's we had, like, overhead, overhead transparencies. And we also weren't smart enough to use Brian's story as a mechanism to influence people. We used data on how many accidents and deaths there were in Nebraska last year. And somewhere along the line, we got smart and said, wait a minute, Brian, you need to tell your story. And you need people to understand how that impacts life. And so it's the most meaningful thing that we do for him here is assisting him. That first presentation, to go back to the learning, he lasted less than two minutes. He was so distracted. It was so overwhelming. It was a small group of people that knew him really well. And I remember thinking, well, I don't think this is going to work. And today... If you fast forward 25 years later, he rolls into a uh, he rolls into a room filled with people, greets everyone, plays the video, and fields questions for 25 or 30 minutes. 30 minutes. And if you would have told me back then that he would get to the point of doing that, I would have said, I, I don't see how that would be possible. But he did it through this. He did it through learning, and that's so cool that we learned so much that even people with significant injuries continue to learn. So here's some tips um, on how you uncover stories. I think it's just it's so often that we're, we are designed to give answers as clinicians, constantly giving information. I think we need to spend more time just listening and asking questions and being curious. Just just be nosy. People, people like to tell their stories. Um, and, and let them know that you're invested. You're Tell them what you're trying to do. I really, I really want to get, get to know, know you so that we can incorporate what's most important in your world, in your program here, so that we can help you go a life you're excited about. Tell them. Um, we talked about this. Check your biases. If you look at that sheet and you see, you see, oh, there's a typo right there. I'm, I'm so wanting to fix that right now. Everyone, everyone <laughs> should get a fair shot. Um, that's great. That was up on the screen last week for like 200 and some people and now 200 and some today. Um, don't be a perfectionist. So that's another one, right? Yeah, there you go. Be empathetic. Imagine if instead of saying I know. And that one is just, um, it, it's really important. I mean, I've been here now 28 years. I've met a lot of people. I could never tell someone, I know what you're going through. I've met a lot of people. I know what you're going through. I have no clue. It's more powerful to say. I don't, don't know what you're going through, but I'm trying to imagine. That's the creativity, right? I'm trying to imagine if it were if it were me, what I'd be feeling. And that's like telling people that. Be compassionate is is you know there's a difference between empathy and compassion in my book. Empathy is the thought, compassion is action. Do something to help this person. Um, and then I think the other technique is just again we're all struggling. We all have struggles. Um, be vulnerable. Don't compare your struggle. Um, we have a young guy that he was at the he was at the coffee, and uh, I went out with him with his occupational therapist and some video and photos. And they had said the week before when they were out of coffee. Uh, now uh, he's got a, a pretty high level spinal cord injury. He's using a wheelchair, but he's he's actually doing really well. He's walking now, and uh, but he was in his chair. The week before he had walked the week that I had gone for the first time, which was really cool using a walker. But a guy came up to him and said, Hey man, what, what what's your story? What happened? And he said, Well, I had a diving accident and uh, 
broke my neck and got paralyzed. paralyzed. And he said, oh, oh yeah, man, I know, I know what that's like. like. I blew my Achilles, Achilles out last year. <laughs> and it was like, oh, my gosh. And so so our guy was so good. He was like, you know, and he's, he's 18 years old. He's just turned 18. And he's like, I'd rather have people come up and be curious and talk to me as opposed to just like, you know. But our occupational therapist was like fired up. She's like, you, know, you don't know what it's like. She didn't say that, but she wanted to, right? So it, it, don't compare, but but share, right? Share in your life. Um, the vulnerability because, piece is really interesting to me, especially as caregivers or providers. I think we're trained to be so buttoned up and so professional, and it's not about me; it's about them. But the reality is, when I watch some of the best interactions, it's it's this 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 give and take reciprocation. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Appropriately, yeah, yeah. appropriate. Absolutely. Right? I'm not saying go share your deepest life story, story but, but I do think, think that there's a piece of this when you're connecting with someone, whether you're the clinician and they're the, the patient, a level of vulnerability goes along. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's a really great skill when you see it done. You know, and, and I, I think another one's humor too. Like, like, I, 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 I think sometimes, sometimes we take all this, this we, it's serious. We, we should take it really serious. But I would say, if you think about the best eulogy you've ever been to at a funeral, the most powerful eulogy, it always has humor. So if we can do it at a funeral, we can do it in rehab, right? Well-timed, well-placed, appropriate. Um, so yeah, I think humor would be something else I would, I would add in, in terms of like being vulnerable, be genuine, be yourself. Um, there's no way we have time to go through all that. That's just, again, that's a slide if you're interested. This is just sort of a guide of how I would say, all right, you're going you're gonna to try to ferret out somebody's story and, and find out you know, what drives them, what motivates them, what tripped them up in the past, how we can incorporate that now into the program today. These are some, I think it's a great slide because obviously you've done this quite well and, and, and quite often for folks that are unsure or really don't think they have the interview skills. Just have three questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It could just, yeah, pick a couple of those. It doesn't have to be. I'm, and I don't, I don't sit down with a list. Okay, okay my first question is describe your life. Another, another typo. All right, we're moving. Um, <laughs> But I, I wouldn't read. I wouldn't read through it, right? So, um, yeah, organic. Pick, pick a few. I, I had a great. I heard a great story. A lot of the stories are by proxy around here. We had a, a one of our guys with a spinal cord injury. I was actually at this conference, and he got baptized in our swimming pool. I don't know if you saw that up there, but the church came and baptized him. I'm like, oh, I mean, again, a trans like transforming and just just story. Not you know not. You forget that, that like the, the religious context, context just the, him now like transforming his life like, like how cool is that new community he's got a church several of our team members go to this church i'm sorry that i missed it but they, there's a video that i'm really excited to see a professional video his dad apparently got up and said he said i'm a mechanic and i fix things and i'm really good at fixing things and i couldn't fix this right so these are like the stories and it made me think of, wow, that's really powerful. I know we're, we have a guy who's, who's significant other as an architect. And I wonder if I asked her, how has it been helping when you're an architect and you typically can sit down and draw up the plans exactly how it's going to be in the future and you don't know what, what this might be, right? So you can cater questions to people based on what they do. What a great question to ask a mechanic. Right. So, boom, that's in my head the next time. Um, so there's just all these stories that are, that are up that kind of, they kind of give you different ideas of how you can dig a little deeper with people too. Okay. We're going to run. If it's okay, story. I'm going to launch the poll. Uh, if you're, those of you listening, remember back, this is the one time you will get a poll question. We'll go ahead and launch that. Um, it'll be up for here a minute or so, we've got about five minutes. Uh, left for any other comments and banter and discussion. So I'll launch into the poll question now. So you should see that on your screen. Just please answer that. Yeah, John, I think that that point just goes back to if you understand that that person's a mechanic, it gives you some built in material, it gives you some built in ways of being curious mm -hmm. that then you can connect yeah. their struggles and yeah. you can connect whatever it is they're going through to something that is meaningful to them, which again, it goes back to the bone of with meaning component, but you would never be able to do that 
if you never got to the point of him saying, I'm a mechanic and I fix things. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or building, building a relationship, relationship or asking, being curious and asking questions and finding out what's important. Mm -hmm. And yeah, th this, this whole slide, we don't have time on it, but this was, this was really quickly, I think a really important one. The people who thrive and adapt don't say, I can't because I can't because of this injury, I can't because of this pain, I can't because of this wheelchair. They say, I could if. And so, that's, um, I know you've read the book, A Beautiful Constraint. I don't remember hardly anything out of the book, but I remember that. Um, and I've always remembered that. And I think about that a lot. That's the goal when you're trying to get people to adapt. It works for us too. If, you, if you're sitting there saying, this all sounds great, but I can't because I don't even work directly with a person or I don't have time. Ask yourself, well, I could if. I could learn more about their story if what? Mm -hmm. If I changed that assessment, if I added to the form, if I picked up the phone and actually called, what could you do that you could learn that story more? So these constraints fit all of us. And constraints actually are a good thing. If you didn't have any constraints, you wouldn't create. If you had all the time in the world, you had all the money in the world, you had all the resources, you'd always have tomorrow to start. And you'd be overwhelmed with all the options. So I love that book, too. The, the takeaway that I had is like, good if. And then to that point, if there are no constraints, it's actually way harder. It's way harder. Um, and, and it talks, it tells lots of stories in the book about when there are no constraints, you don't really know where to start and you need those constraints to give you some yeah. direction and almost narrow your focus. And it's, it's not, not to minimize the constraints, especially our folks that, that you know, have a high level of spinal cord injury. You would never say, well, that constraint's actually a good thing. <laughs> like you never say that, but it's, it's going to force them if they're going to thrive, it's going to force them to innovate and maybe open up. Avenues that never would have been open before. And we've seen a lot of that. So, so how do you lean into those constraints? How do you get people to say, well, I could have? Um, because it's so common to say, I can't because. Yeah. Well, for all of us, we all do that. It's so just kind of human nature, hardwired to, to encounter a struggle and, and shut down and say, well, I can't because of this brick wall for me. Yep. So. All right, we are coming up on time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll question. So if you didn't uh, get that, um, let us know. And just again, a few takeaways that that I had. Kathleen uh, drew this out as well as she loved the I'm trying to imagine quote, John. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really good takeaway. I'm trying to imagine what it might be like. Um, so I think that I could if um, understanding the, the constraints, especially for, for this group, there are constraints and um, we have to work, work through that to understand these the stories of the individuals that we work with. And yeah. That, for our group. that went fast. You make a more podcast style and all of a sudden you're just like, because this presentation is normally about, if I'm doing all the talking, about 40 minutes long. Yeah. So, so yeah. We have yeah, another, we have another uh, suggestion, which I think is another good one. When you are back up and running in terms of um, keeping their new mindset and helping them understand what it used to be like and, uh, you know, where you might be going. Yeah. It's another great yeah, uh, yeah. comment. Yeah, appreciate that. What a, what a hopeful comment too, when you're back up and running, uh -huh. right? It uh -huh. might look different, uh -huh. you're, but you're just assuming that where you're going to be at today is uh -huh. not where you're going to be tomorrow uh -huh. and moving forward. We're going to be up and running. It's just going to look maybe different or it might look uh -huh. the same. Just yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that comment. That's good. All right. Well, um, as a reminder, we are back next month with sexuality. I really... This is going to, I'm, I'm, I'm this is self talk for me, um, but it is a really serious topic and it's a really, it's a topic that I'm really excited about. Um, but it also, I think it, it will be a little lighthearted in nature, and, and I think that's important too. Yeah, um, yeah but those guys would be great. Laura and yeah. Wendy are going to get that. So that's coming up next month. When you sign off from this webinar, uh, remember it's going to automatically prompt you to fill out the um, the, the webinar uh, review. And in doing that, that will automatically prompt CEUs and slides to be sent. If that doesn't work for you, please let Don or I know uh, and we'll get you set up. Um, but uh, with that, John, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Today. I appreciate it. Um, great content. Uh, I do love the conversation. Hopefully the our audience loves that too. And uh, with that, we'll sign off. Have a good rest yeah. of your week. And we hope to see you back. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.